Back in the 1990s, there was a sociologist named Stephanie Kuntz who wrote this rather interesting and groundbreaking book. Um, in many ways, a book in response, I don't know if you remember back in the 90s, this rising of family values, or this yearning for uh, past family values. And Stephanie Kuntz, who's a sociologist of American family, was interested in seeing what was it like really back uh, in the 50s and 60s. And she titled the book, The Way We Never Were, American Families and the Nostalgic Trap. She takes on the myths we have often about marriage and divorce and child rearing from the 50s. Uh, she called it the father knows best syndrome, right? I know there's probably some younger people who have no idea what I'm referring to, and father knows best. In this deeply researched book, challenges the idea that there was some magical time in the past when families were whole and divorce non-existent and everyone was happy. Kuntz points out statistically that there were actually more teenage pregnancies in the 50s than today. Now, that was in part because the average age of people giving birth was 18. Albeit today, the average firstborn birth for women is 27. And she points out divorce was certainly less common, but this was not because people were happier in their marriage. The truth is, and maybe this is hard for uh, younger women to, to, or younger people in all to really fully realize, but actually within the lifetime of many people in this, in this congregation, the dramatic shift that's happened for women in our country. But at that time in the 50s, uh, woman, women, there were no divorces because women could not be self-sufficient. They they couldn't find jobs, could not work outside of the home, couldn't even have their own credit card. Much less any possibility of any kind of economic self-sufficiency. So her point is there were no divorces, divorces because they could not make that choice. The point being in the book that the myth of father knows best was just an imaginary world just a TV show that didn't really reflect the reality of the world people lived in. Now, I thought of that book because recently I watched a recent documentary, Shiny Happy People. Has anybody seen this? Uh, it's on Amazon Prime, and it's about uh, the Duggar family. You know what the Duggar family is? They are ones that were featured in a reality TV show called 19 and Counting, a show about this family of, uh, in which they had 19 kids. It was about their Christian evangelical parents who were part of a movement called the IBLP, uh, the Institute of Basic Life Principles, with an emphasis uh, on returning to this biblical image of a family. And it's forthright in claiming that image, that theology, is where the wife is under the authority of the husband, then having children is under the authority of, of, of the wife and the sign of God's blessings. Um, the IBLF asserts that corporal punishment is necessary to raise good and moral kids. Homeschooling is the norm to protect your family from the scary and immoral society in which, uh, in which we reside. Needless to say, the documentary, in a very interesting way, exposes a lot of the myths and stories and problems underlying this biblical vision of the American family. We all yearn for a past that never existed. And there are biblical interpretations, if you read the scriptures, that paint a picture of the so-called faithful family with its expected gender roles and expectations. 
And it's not surprising because many of the biblical stories we read or hear on Sunday mornings are rooted in very ancient patterns of patriarchy, ancient patterns in which women were treated as property of their husbands. The good old days, right? These biblical interpretations of the particular role of women was ascendant in many Christian circles and still is. Continues to hold sway in some of the debates, political and cultural, that we experience and read about uh, these days in the newspaper or hear over the news or see on social media. In many ways, uh, the idea is a kind of version of controlling women by keeping them barefoot and pregnant. Now the story of Sarah would appear to be just such an example, if you think about it. The story opens with three strangers appearing to Abraham and Sarah at the Oaks of Mimbre. These three strangers represent the Lord God. And Abraham, in a show of hospitality, invites them, rest under a tree, wash your feet, and offers them sustenance, nourishment for their journey. He then goes off and tells Sarah instructions on how she should cook the cakes, and that she should cook the cakes. And he goes off and tells the servants, oh, prepare the calf good and tender. And it strikes me in this story that Abraham, who's supposed to be this model of hospitality, which he is in, in welcoming, but he doesn't do a lot of the work necessarily, does he? Sarah cooks the cakes, the slaves, the servants cook the calf, and he gets all the credit, right? It's an interesting detail of the story. And then the story shifts. The Lord, represented in the three strangers, asks Abraham, Abraham a question that maybe Abraham didn't expect. He asked, the Lord asked, where is Sarah, your wife? It's out of the blue. And Abraham says, well, back in the tent there. And then the Lord makes this bold assertion, I will return to you in due season and your wife, Sarah, will have a son. So, It seems to me most obviously in this story that the Lord came not to visit Abraham in our story as much as to talk to Sarah, to pronounce this possibility. This story is about Sarah. Abraham's just this side character, if you will. We are told that Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Now, one of the things we must fully understand about Scripture is that it's about as earthy and down-to-earth as you can imagine in describing the human condition. It's real, which means she had passed menopause, if you will, and the sheer impossibility of having a child. And in this marvelous moment in the story, she just laughs at the impossibility of it. She laughs to herself and says, well, after I have grown old and my husband is old, she says, shall I be fruitful? Now, this is an interesting detail of this story. The Hebrew word here translated in our in in our version, our interpretation is fruitful, is actually the Hebrew word which actually would be better translated, and it is in other versions of this text, it is supposed to be translated as pleasure. Which means, after I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure. I suspect that uh, translators kind of translated that word because that's a little scandalous, isn't it? A little risque. We might have to ban that from the schools, right? It's too earthy, too scandalous. In the world of Father Knows Best, they never showed the parents sleeping in the same bed. Can't have that. 
but not in this story. Then the Lord asks, Sarah, why did you laugh? And I, it's interesting to, to read this story and, and to kind of try to imagine this conversation that, that Sarah will have with God. That somewhat embarrassed and maybe a little frightened that she had laughed in the face of God. Sarah says, I didn't laugh. And yet, in the story, the Lord won't let her deny it. She, he, the God says, yes, you did. And I kind of imagine this back and forth in this conversation between the Lord and Sarah. No, I didn't laugh. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Right? There is a sense, and in, in probably we, we miss this, a sense of merriment here. A kind of back and forth between Sarah and the Lord God that is filled not with condemnation, not with expectation, but filled with laughter and teasing. In a sense of a relationship that's profoundly meaningful and profound. Yes, Sarah spoke to God and laughed. Sarah is the woman who laughed at God's grace and gift, and God laughs with her. Do you know what Sarah named her son? Isaac? Does anybody know what the name Isaac means? The one who laughed. She laughs because there's this amazing line, is anything too wonderful for the Lord, right? That this story really is about Sarah and not about Abraham. It is about a woman's encounter with God in which she shares a laugh with God. That the wonderfulness of God who works through a woman to found a people and a nation, despite the limitations the world might place upon her, despite she's married to some old fuddy-duddy, right? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? And the promise is a gift that makes Sarah laugh. And God laughed right along with her. And I think the story should remind us that we should all be Sarahs around here. That this is not a story of patriarchy or of power, of, of someone controlling someone else. It's not a story defining gender roles or expectations. It's a story about the wonderful things God does among us despite our limitations of age or gender or social expectations. It is a story of delight and laughter. And I think that's important to remember, that our faith is less about what the rules are or what the expectations are or what roles, people, uh, what we, roles we tell people they should fulfill. What it is really about is joy and delight and laughter. Let's all be Sarahs. To God be the glory this day and forevermore. Amen.